a minute. Uh, but uh, Damon Wilson is the uh, president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. And Frank Emerson um, has uh, a long career, over 26 year experience working in US national security and foreign policy matters. He also has 17 years experience working for the uh, CIA. He, uh, he worked for nine years uh, for the State Department as a legal attache in the Netherlands, and then he represented uh, the United States in uh, international courts. Uh, and uh, I uh, am the Bennett Director of the Moroz Global Leadership Institute. I'm also an instructor in the International Studies Program. Uh, I, I study Eastern Europe, democracy, and collective memory. And I'm going to start with uh, making a couple of remarks about, uh, about the conflict. I have a, a couple of slides that I want to show, uh, share with you, uh, but then for the most part, I want to make three points. Uh, but uh, before I get there, I just want to say that uh, the process, or the, what, what happened over the last four weeks uh, has shook Ukraine, has shook Europe and the world, and this, these are dark days, have been dark days for, uh, for Ukraine, for Ukrainian citizens. It's a major humanitarian crisis that, uh, is, uh, that exists in Ukraine right now. Uh, during the first week or so, we were trying to understand the unimaginable. We were trying to process what happens. Uh, when we moved from this point, when uh, things are going as normal, Russian troops uh, build up on the, on the Ukrainian border to the point where uh, Ukrainian cities are bombed by missiles and bombs and by airplanes. And now we also have evidence that civilian targets are bombed indiscriminately. Uh, and so, so this, this map is just briefly showing where Ukraine has been attacked. So Ukraine has been attacked in the north, from the east, and from the south. The Crimean Peninsula in the south was already captured by Russia in 2014. And right now, the biggest city that has been captured by the Russian troops, by the Russian military, is the city of Kherson. Uh, and uh, the other cities, so, so the capital, it has been surrounded, uh, and, and the city of uh, Kharkiv has been battled. Uh, the city of Mariupol uh, in the, in the uh, south, uh, southeast uh, has been attacked uh, and has been surrounded, has been destroyed between, by different estimates, Ukrainian estimates, between 85 and 90 percent of uh, Mariupol, this, um, uh, the buildings uh, ha have been either destroyed or uh, damaged. Um, and so I want to, uh, and I, uh, th this is a map that, that shows uh, the airstrikes on, by, uh, in different Ukrainian regions, and we can see that uh, the attacks have not been only targeting eastern or southern or, or, or uh, northern parts of Ukraine. Uh, cities uh, as far as the city of Lviv uh, in western Ukraine have been attacked. And so there is no particular, uh, it's hard to distinguish the pattern here, but then uh, all major regions in Ukraine uh, have been under attack. There has been a major international response to, uh, to, to this invasion. Uh, there, there, have been, uh, there has been a response by, by governments around the world, by private sector. These are companies that have been, uh, have, have been working in Russia and has, uh, in uh, Western companies and have, uh, are still remaining in Russia. Some companies withdrew. A lot of companies uh, stopped their operation or suspended their operation or are planning to withdraw completely. Uh, so there has been a, a ma massive uh, exodus of uh, capital of, out of Russia and um, uh, major international reaction from, uh, sent from governments. Uh, in terms of sanctions, uh, I, I, I'm going to briefly touch on this. Uh, these are the number of sanctions that have been imposed um, against Russia, against uh, Russian governments, the Russian government officials, against uh, specific individuals or companies. And you can see that the sanctions that were imposed, imposed in 2014 are, uh, the, the, it, it was a really insignificant number for, uh, compared to sanctions that were imposed in uh, the last several weeks. Uh, and then th this is a list of sanction sanctions uh, or uh, individuals and companies that have been sanctioned by different governments around the world. And what, what's, uh, what's really striking here is uh, a couple of uh, countries here that stand out. Switzerland, a country that has been neutral, uh, has uh, taken a major, major stance here. Uh, a couple of other countries uh, such as Turkey, Hungary, I'm ha happy to talk about these countries uh, during the Q&A. Uh, there have been minor protests in Russia in different Russian cities. There have been arrests, about 5,300 arrests in uh, 74 Russian cities, but for the most part, protests uh, in Russia have been contained. People arrested and people are detained. 
Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to come back to my original slide and I, I want to make three points here. So this is sort of the, uh, the general picture where we are right now. Uh, and I want to make three points uh, in the next uh, five or so minutes, uh, uh, so three or four minutes. So why uh, the, the, the troops on the, Russian, on the Ukrainian border, uh, we, we've re been receiving messages about these troops since about March, uh, April 2021. And the international community, the U.S., the Europeans have been telling us that there are hundreds of thousands of, of troops. There is 120,000, 150,000. There is a buildup that has not particularly worried Ukrainians uh, since. Uh, and, and, and the reason because uh, well, why Ukrainians were not particularly worried about this, uh, because Ukraine was attacked in 2014 for the first time. So the war against Ukraine started in 2014. And since 2014, Russia conducted a number of military exercises on the Ukrainian border, uh, sometimes in collaboration with Belarus, sometimes in cooperation in a, a single military exercises just by Russia. So um, there were snap drills in, in February 2014, uh, access, military exercises, Vostok in November 2014, Kafkaz 2016, Zapad. <laughs> And, uh, with, in collaboration with Belarus in 2017. So, in other words, over the last year, Ukrainians have been living with, uh, with this presence of the Russian troops on the border, but then business was sort of more, more as, uh, as usual. Um, not, not that this, these uh, things ha should be trivialized, and, uh, but then Ukrainians have been living with the buildup of Russian troops on the border since uh, the year t uh, 2014. And the second point I want to make is this idea of neutrality. Um, many of, of us during the last two days have been wondering if uh, John Moros was here with us today, what would he say and what would he do about the current crisis? And he would probably say that um, we need to talk to our counterparts. He would probably say that we need to use diplomacy, compromise, we need to keep open uh, the channels of communications. And so in other words, uh, we need to find a way to compromise. So what will this compromise look like? Uh, and so any compromise would require, uh, in the way how the compromise is viewed by Russia, it would require some form of neutrality by Ukraine. And my concern is that the Russian vision of neutrality is not how we see neutrality. In Russian vision of neutrality, Ukraine is going to be denied territorial integrity, sovereignty, and uh, even independent history. Russia has been describing Ukraine as uh, the same people as Russia, fraternal brotherly nations. And uh, by these statements, we, we were not paying too much attention to these statements, but these statements were sending us a signal that uh, Russia has not been, or at least the Kremlin has not been viewing Ukraine as an independent state, as a sovereign state. And uh, the reason why I have concerns about uh, the Russian vision of neutrality is because Ukraine de facto was neutral. Legally, Ukraine was neutral between 1991 and 2007, and between 2010 and, and uh, 2014. So in March 2014, when uh, Ukra the Ukrainian Penin uh, Crimean Peninsula was uh, annexed by Russia, Ukraine was de jure, uh, legally, and independent, a, 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 a neutral state. Because in, uh, uh, in, in 2010, when Viktor Yanukovych came to power, he actually uh, introduced, there was a bill that was introduced, and the bill was signed into the law uh, to, that guaranteed the in, uh, neutral status of Ukraine. So Ukraine, by law, by the Ukrainian law, was a neutral status that Ukraine was, there was no vision in Ukraine uh, between 2010 and 2014 to join NATO. And then we, uh, the, the Russian, the Kremlin has been referring to uh, 2014 and uh, in, in 2014 to the protests of Ukrainians uh, and Russia was describing these protests as a threat to its sovereignty and, and territorial and, and Russian, so Russian security. Uh, suggesting that it was, uh, Ukraine was on the way to join NATO. Well, the protests in 2013, 2014 were actually not about NATO. The protests were about Ukrainian closer integration with the European Union. Ukraine was uh, seeking closer economic ties with the EU, and then when that policy decision was not uh, followed, uh, followed through by the Ukrainian president, people flooded the streets, and uh, they started, uh, and they protested against the policy decision. 
The question in 2013 and 2014 during the protest was not about Ukraine joining or not joining NATO. Again, legally Ukraine uh, was a neutral state in 2014. Legally uh, by, uh, binding, there was, it was a law that was binding Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's uh, neutrality. Ukraine was not allowed to join military alliances in 2014. Um, and so despite Ukrainian neutrality, Russia intervened and Russia violated Ukrainian sovereignty in 2014. Uh, and Russia did that in the uh, 1990s. Russia did that in 2004 during the uh, Orange Revolution. Uh, Russia intervened in Ukrainian uh, neutrality, in Ukrainian sovereignty and sovereign decision making even before, uh, in, sometimes in different ways. Uh, in 2014 it was military ways, in 2004 it was in more covert ways, uh, you know, when Vladimir Putin was supporting uh, Viktor Yanukovych's presidency, presidential bid. So the story here is that uh, Ukraine has been a neutral state in 1990s, in, two, in 2000s, in 2010, 2014. And uh, the difference that w w when Ukraine started pursuing the membership in the NATO alliance was after the Munich speech by the Vladimir Putin after 2007, when Vladimir Putin uh, uh, issued uh, or, or had a, uh, a speech at the Munich conference, security conference, and when he was denouncing the West for its intervention or in uh, uh, Russia's sphere of influence, in expanding to the borders of, uh, of Russia. And so only after the Munich speech by Vladimir Putin did President Yushchenko start making steps to uh, uh, to, to, to off to, to, and he started seeking uh, the membership action plan in NATO. Before that, uh, th that was not on the table. That was not a debate for Ukrainian policymakers. The public opinion was not a, in favor of NATO uh, in 2008 and 2014. Only in, in recent years, after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, did public opinion on NATO and Ukraine started changing. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. So I, again, I wanted to comment on uh, Ukrainian neutrality. Uh, that's uh, the, the way how we see neutrality is, uh, is not what uh, this, uh, if the way how Russia sees neutrality is not how we see neutrality. In other words, neutrality is not going to resolve the crisis in Ukraine. The uh, neutrality is not going to cause the withdrawal of Russian troops in, in Ukraine. What Russia wants, in my perspective and in perspective of those scholars who study these, uh, the, the neutrality of states in former Soviet Union, uh, in the Soviet uh, sphere of influence, Russia wants to dismember Ukraine. Russia wants uh, to have a compliant Ukraine with limited sovereignty so that foreign policy decisions are, are not made in Ukraine, in the capital of Ukraine. Um, and so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to hand the microphone to Frank. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, other issues during the Q&A. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Max, for uh, having me here today on such an important topic. Uh, my prayers are with you, your family, and the people of Ukraine right now. You know, ever since the end of World War II, we've been saying never again when it comes to genocide. But here we are today saying here we are again, and it's happening again. Here we go again, unfortunately, for the Ukrainian people. We've seen it in the former Yugoslavia. We've seen it in Africa. We've seen it, we're seeing it now in China, and now with the Russian invasion. Um, we're seeing it again with the Ukrainian people. Max asked me to speak a little bit about the legal issues related to the Russian crime of aggression. And I use that term because that's one of the four core crimes that the International Criminal Court has the authority to speak and prosecute on. Um, but besides, before we get to the International Criminal Court, I think we need to just consider all of the various legal remedies and avenues that the Ukrainian government has at its disposal and discuss whether or not it's using all of those uh, efficiently and correctly. And so far they are. We have not only the International Criminal Court, but we've got the International Court of Justice, 
the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. And since 2014, when Russia first committed the crime of aggression, the Ukrainian government followed through in pursuing jurisdiction for the International Criminal Court, those of you that do not have any background with the International Criminal Court, in order for the court to actually prosecute crimes, a country has to become a member of that treaty, what's known as the Rome Treaty or the Rome Statute. The United States is not a member, Russia is not a member, China is not a member, the big countries such as those are, are not members, India as well. But Ukraine was not a member of the treaty. It asked after the invasion for the International Criminal Court to actually give it jurisdiction and prosecute crimes that have occurred within Ukraine. Now, even though Russia is not a member of um, the treaty, the crimes it's committing are now on the territory of Ukraine who has accepted jurisdiction, which gives the ICC the ability to, to prosecute uh, Russia for the crimes. As I said, there are four big crimes, the war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of, of aggression. As we look at genocide, there's a statute, there's a convention, the 1948 convention, which the United States is a member of, and a number of other countries, most of, most of the world has signed on to the convention at this point. There are a few elements that the genocide convention requires in order to find that genocide is occurring. And if you look at the situation now in Ukraine, I think you can clearly answer yes, that genocide is occurring, and it's something that should be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. I can go quickly through those elements, but first you have to have an act, an act being murder, forcibly transferring uh, children, causing bodily or mentally har mental harm uh, to a certain group of people, whether it be national, ethnic, or religious, um, with the intent to destroy that people, whole or in part. It doesn't have to be the whole country, it could just be a, whole, a city, and there's international criminal precedent that provides for that. If you just look at Putin's language over the last few weeks, you can see that he is pursuing genocide in Ukraine. He makes a lot of statements regarding what is happening there as far as moving the people out, cleansing, etc. But as we, as we move forward towards getting to back to that phrase of never again, we have to start thinking about this geno genocide convention in a broad application, not only with what's happening in, in Ukraine now, right now with what Russia is doing, but start looking around at the other countries that are supporting it. The Genocide Convention allows for the prosecution for things like conspiracy to commit genocide, for um, attempting to commit genocide, or complicity to commit genocide. So if we look at countries like Belarus, who allowed Putin to stage his troops in their country before the invasion, we have complicity. If you look at countries like China and Syria, China, who at every turn on the international forum, such as the International Court of Justice, such as the Security Council, such as behind closed doors, giving Putin the support that he needs to go forward when knowing that sanctions were coming, we need to start applying the other aspects of the Genocide Convention so that we can get back to never again. At least that's what we wanted to do, is to be at never again. Also, countries like Syria, who are sending troops to fight in Ukraine. Now off to the, uh, the other courts. I mentioned the International Court of Justice. The International Court, Court of Justice does not actually prosecute crimes, but it's there's a dispute resolution mechanism. It's the United Nations Court, also known as the World Court. Ukraine put forward an application back in 2014. It put forward another application just recently, and the International Court of Justice has found 13 to 2. The two votes no were Russia and China that Russia must stop its crime of aggression 
and halt all of its activities there. The European Court of Human Rights, which Ukraine expeditiously put forward um, a request to stop all activities and also to find that um, sovereignty has been violated and that human rights are being violated, also found for Ukraine. And the, inter the European Court of Justice recently found as well that all sanctions related to Russia and its activities with the crime of aggression in Ukraine were justified, meaning the sanctions are allowed in this instance. So Ukraine has done everything that it can possibly do from a legal remedy standpoint. Now it's just waiting on the world to actually do something to help it. From a Security Council perspective, if you're familiar with the Security Council, there are 15 members, five permanent members, Russia, China, the United States, United Kingdom, and France, but there are also 10 rotating members. The Security Council cannot act because those five permanent members have the veto power. But it's not without precedent for the world community to set up some sort of international tribunal if the International Criminal Court is not able to pursue and actually prosecute these crimes. Nuremberg was, had no precedent, and it had no UN uh, charter, United Nations Charter, or Security Council to actually establish it. So there is precedent for moving forward, whether it be some type of other world tribunal that's signed on by the UN General Assembly, or even just another court formed by the European Union in order to prosecute this crime of aggression and the other three crimes that are occurring there, the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Perhaps, okay, I'll head up. I was gonna say seated. All right. Terrific, some of you heard me talk a little bit earlier in an earlier talk so I'm going to try not to, I'll try to avoid some of those pieces and just offer a little bit that Max suggested I speak to both the threat to democracy from the Kremlin and the story of democratic reforms in Ukraine and how that comes together today. And so first, I do think that as Max pointed out what Putin is focused on in Ukraine, but to me this is a much bigger struggle that we've seen. It's the arc, almost a predictable arc, of Vladimir Putin over years of messaging. And it is about extinguishing the concept of freedom and democracy as much as it is about extinguishing the Ukrainian identity. It's linked, which is why there are war crimes, the potential for genocide here. It traces its origin to who Vladimir Putin is, a KGB colonel, someone who saw uh, um, when he served in, in East Germany he saw what happened as the Berlin wall, wall fell around him. Soviet Union then later crumbled. His rise to power was trained in Leningrad where he got involved with criminal and mafia networks and shipping and making cash. His rise to power with Boris Yeltsin is the story of a KGB takeover of a failed democratic transition in Russia. Bringing that, those relationships deep relationships of trust and confidence inside the KGB network, those tactics, those instincts. It's important to recall that his rise to power and leadership in Russia has been pretty well documented, was based on the orchestration of an attack on two Moscow apartment buildings, blamed on Chechens that justified him going back to war in Chechnya in the Second Chechen War and leveling Grozny, slaughtering Chechens. This is how he came to power in Russia, by orchestrating the death of almost 300 Russians and blaming it on Chechens. Little consequence if you think, what are the implications of what happened and what we're dealing with? He's learned as well that each time that the West really wanted a partner in Russia, we actually didn't want Russia as an enemy. And so we were often willing to turn a blind eye or to turn the page, and he learned to manipulate and welcome that. 9-11 hit, saw an alignment of we're in this fight together against terrorists. It helped him sort of cover up the fight against Chechens because maybe they were terrorists. 
I was there at NATO headquarters working for uh, NATO Secretary General Lord Robertson. When we gathered at a summit after 9-11 in Rome in 2002, and we signed the Rome Declaration creating the NATO-Russia Council. President Bush at the time said this offered the prospect of an alliance with the alliance. This was an idea developed in the Clinton administration. Americans, we, the West, we didn't see Russia as an enemy. We didn't want Russia as an enemy. And we, were, in fact, were trying to stretch out an arm on how could this be possible to build the concept of a Europe whole and free from Vancouver to Vladivostok that actually included Russia in this discourse. And there's a whole series that I, I do in another lecture that talks about that series of outreach to Russia and how it was rebuffed. But the essence of the story is that as we were trying to do this, Vladimir Putin was consolidating control at home, becoming the autocrat, the, the trajectory of a KGB leader that he was. And the bargain of rising incomes in Russia, when that started to get rocky, he started to use confrontation with the West, a more nationalist approach to legitimize his authority and control at home. So confrontation with the West became correlated to consolidation of his legitimacy at home as legitimacy was being eroded from a public contract that could have been rising freedoms and, and wealth for the Russian people. And we saw in this period the crackdown at home. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the richest man in Russia, in prison. The sign to all the oligarchs breaking apart their empires or controlling them. The merger of a kleptocratic state in which the KGB leader politically is now in charge of the economic assets and the merger of that. We saw shortly after that the assassination in 2006 of Anna Polaskaeva, the silencing of one of the prominent independent journalists and critics of the regime to send a chilling message to civil society and the media. The repression wave began. As Max said, then Vladimir Putin showed up in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference with Bob Gates in the room, and he threw down the gauntlet and said, game's up. You know, I am not on board with this post-Cold War order, with what we're trying to do here. And in front of the entire Western audience, he said, I don't want anything to do with this. And he challenged the West at that meeting in MSC. But we really didn't want to hear it. We, we didn't want to hear that message. So we sort of just didn't listen to him. He couldn't have been more explicit. Three months after that meeting, he launched a, nation, a massive cyber attack on Estonia, the first time taking a NATO ally, wiping out their ability to operate, shutting down their procedures. Test case, how would we respond? Well, we didn't know what to do. Is a cyber attack, of, we didn't know what to do. He got away with it. That next year in 2008, I was at the Bucharest summit with President Bush, where we were both trying to achieve a major strategic defense, missile defense deal with the Russians and to begin to open membership action plans for Ukraine and Georgia. It was pretty clear to us in the negotiations that the Russians were not going, that the, the negotiations weren't about getting to yes. They weren't going to do a deal. There were negotiations to go in circles. And we failed at the Bucharest summit to have clarity on what to do with Ukraine and came out with an amb ambiguous outcome. The next day in the meeting with Vladimir Putin in Bucharest, in front of all NATO leaders, he mocked the idea of Ukrainian sovereignty to their face and scorned the idea of the, idea of, of the concept of Ukraine being an independent nation. Shortly after that, we have the invasion of Russia. I mean, the invasion of Georgia, in which we saw preparations for this, but we didn't want to believe. I even was in the White House at the time. We didn't want to believe that they would actually do it. And yet we saw this wasn't just an invasion that happened like that. They literally had to spend time rebuilding the military railroads that connected their, for, their forces to Georgia. And they rebuilt this railroad to prepare for that invasion in plain sight. We saw everything and yet didn't want to put our minds around the fact that this intelligence was suggesting there could be attack on Georgia. That's why the Biden administration went public with all the intelligence this time. We see it over and over and didn't want to believe it. This is paralleled in time with 
the, um, the death of Sergei Mag Mag the Magnitsky Act, you may have heard, someone who was exposing corruption in Russia, tortured, killed, 2019, the attack, the annexation of Crimea, the attack on Donbass, 2015, the entry of Russian forces into Syria, we saw this tactics to wipe out Aleppo. As this is happening in 2015, Boris Nemtsov, the leading political opposition figure, assassinated, most likely from Chechens that were directly answerable. Kadyrov only answers to the Kremlin. Nemtsov's deputy, Vladimir Karamurza, poisoned. He survived. The introduction of uh, the introduction of Russian forces across Africa from the Central African Republic, the Wagner Group that now operates in the Sahel, the interference in our elections in 2016, the brazen assassination of a former KGB officer in the United Kingdom on British territory, followed by the assassination of another person in Berlin, in Turkey, three NATO allies, the poisoning of Navalny. So we've seen this right up front, and yet we've wanted to try to avoid a confrontation, not to fall into the trap of a Cold War, but he's been consistent, consistent in his messaging, and we didn't want to hear that, and we're facing the consequences of it today. It's not just about Ukraine. It's about his challenge to the idea that democracy and freedom could exist. It's an existential threat to his rule if people have a say in their future. And that's where we come to Ukraine because the Ukrainians are showing what Putin fears. The story of Ukraine's resistance, of stopping a massive Russian invasion force today, is a story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It's exactly what Vladimir Putin fears. And what often gets lost in the coverage of the high-stakes diplomacy before the war, during American, Russian, European officials, is that the Ukrainians are going to have a say in this matter. We were saying before the war, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. But it still implied that the power, the decisions rested with the great powers. Ukrainians have shown that they, even with, when they were saddled with poor leadership before the war, were going to have a say in their own future. In 1991, the Ukrainian people voted 92% for independence and an 84% turnout, including a majority in Crimea, helping to precipitate the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the Orange Revolution, the population mobilized in the freezing winter of 2004-2005 after their vote for president was stolen in corrupt elections and civil mobilization forced a rerun that produced a new leader. After the Russian attack on Donbass, I mean, after the, before the Russian attack on Donbass, the Russian pressure on the president to drop a deal, basically a trade deal with the EU, prompted the Euromaidan, a revolution of dignity in which the leader was forced to, to turn, say we're going to align with Moscow economically. And the, the Ukrainian people turned out in the frigid winter again of 2013-2014 to say no. And they, did, they protested, demanded a European, that is a free future. A hundred protesters paid with their lives fighting for the concept of being part of Europe. And it produced the revolution of dignity. And think about that name, it was the chance of dignity for people. I've talked to Ukrainian leaders, a prime minister who spent a lot of time with Vladimir Putin, and she said that the way that Vladimir Putin spoke to them was to take away their dignity. She said the way he used Russian, the dialect, he, he is so crass. It was like you're speaking to an uneducated, like a thug, speaking to an uneducated peasant. And that was sort of the language, the approach, the mentality of how to make the Ukrainians feel. And so their revolution is a revolution of dignity. It's beautiful. Putin responded by annexing Crimea, invading the Donbass. Civil society mobilized when the army was very weak, and they rushed volunteers to the army. They gave rise to a very distinct movement of army volunteers to defend the country. Civil society has played a paramount role in responding to the armed violence in the East. It's pretty remarkable. We've seen the efforts of disinformation, it's Ukrainian groups from Stop Fact, the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, Inform Resist, Euromaidan Press, Hamadska TV, all that mobilized to expose that. 
I was talking, my organization supports 100 Ukrainian, organ, 100 Ukrainian organizations, and I was talking to one of them, they're working on humanitarian assistance as the war is unfolding, saying, how is this being coordinated? How are you doing this? And say, look, you need to understand if this was controlled and centralized and run from Kyiv, nothing would work. It's all decentralized. We're all doing our own thing. It's all interconnected and it's working because ordinary people are mobilized across the country doing or extraordinary things. And this is the resistance that we see. So Putin, despite his protestations, perhaps does understand people power because that's actually what he fears. He scoffs at democracy in small states because he yearns for the days of a Congress of Vienna from your history when great powers led by great leaders could decide the fate of nations. It's not NATO that threatens Russia. It certainly isn't Ukraine. Putin fears people, and he first and foremost fears his own people. A successful free Ukrainian Slavic brothers, sisters doing well, what an existential threat to his rule in Russia for Russians to see that. Like all authoritarians, he fears his own people, and so he thrusts the entire world into a completely fabricated crisis because he learned from the past that he could turn the page, get away with it, avoid the costs, because we would slap him on the wrist, do something that was bearable. So now we need to count that he's miscalculated because that means that we are resolved in our effort. Rather, democracies today have to meet this moment with democratic unity and strength, with solidarity with Ukraine as a nation, and also solidarity with the people of Russia who deserve so much better. Thank you. Thank you, Damon and uh, Frank. And now we have about 10 minutes uh, before the next session. If we have any questions, uh, we'll take uh, several questions at the time, and then uh, our panelists will have, we can choose several um, or ch questions to, to answer. There's a microphone. There is a microphone behind you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you all. That was terrific, um, Damon. Um, if you could try and help us understand the political calculus itself in terms of just in your, in your own um, independence from the U.S., given your role and the role of the institution, um, where, where you'd handicap you know, the next really critical couple of steps. Let's take a couple of questions. Um, thank you all very much. That was a wonderful presentation. I have a very specific question about the, um, the bombing in Lviv, Lviv, about I'm just concerned, I mean, obviously for everything else, but I wanted to know if you could tell us anything about the moving towards the West and towards Poland and um, if that's something we need to focus on. Thank you. Hello. My name is Maja Piščević. I work from the Atlantic, for the Atlantic Council and I live in Serbia. And Serbia today is the only country that hasn't imposed sanctions on Russia in Europe. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and I'm happy to be able to talk to Damon, to hear, I mean, all of you, but listening to, to what Damon is doing at NED and all the other organizations that are helping the Ukrainians today is really historically important. And I think beginning of something that will change the world, hopefully in, 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 in a good direction, as bad as this situation looks today. And so first, thank you, Damon, and thank you all. It, it really moves us to hear what you're doing. The second thing is, I'm trying to find some silver lining in this situation, and it's really hard. And, and I know that people will tell me, just shut up, there is no silver lining. But look at Europe. Putin managed in one day to, to, in, to reborn the, uh, the solidarity, the resilience, to strengthen uh, Euro-Atlantic partnership. 
he managed in one day to end Switzerland's neutrality and, and <laughs> Germany's uh, struggle never to engage ever more and to make a huge shift in its economy. Let's try to think at least with part of our hearts and part of our minds in that direction and let's help Ukrainians, but let's work on these things that can really change the future of the world and the geopolitics of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Damon, do you want to start with um, uh, the political sure. calculus question? Just a couple, couple of points here. Uh, look, on the political calculus, the Ukrainians have changed the political calculus because they've, they've exceeded the world's expectations and they've exceeded their expectations. And so success begets success in a campaign like this where they now have a psychological ed of, edge, if not a military edge. It's really important. Ukrainians, when the war began, 54% thought that they could stop Russians, which is pretty good, actually, given the circumstances. Today, a poll came out. It's 94% of Ukrainians think they can stop the Russians. That's very significant because this is psychological. You've got to think that means every individual understands if they can contribute, help the resistance. That puts momentum on the Ukrainian side psychologically. It also has changed the Western response because what happened when Crimea was taken, the Ukrainians didn't resist. Also, they didn't resist on Western advice. This time they said, no, thank you, we are fighting. We are not going, we are staying. Not only did Zelensky say he's staying, we support 100 organizations across Ukraine. We reached out before, said, can we help you? We're gonna help fund you if you need evacuation. Not one said they wanted to leave. They wanted to stay in Kharkiv and Mariupol and Kherson and fight. This group's fight without weapons, the civilian resistance. This is huge because it changed our calculation and made it worth the investment as our public opinion shifted, our political will shifted. We're doing things, as Maya said, that were unimaginable. The problem is it will get worse before it gets better because the Russians have used their precision guided munitions. They failed in their attack, which they thought would be a quick attack on Kyiv and Kharkiv, followed that by Odessa, the three largest cities, decapitate the government, put in a vassal state, have a, a, a government that could rule, that's not happening. And so it will be a brutal, the Aleppo and Grozny tactics, which you see in Mariupol right now, I fear, I fear what's coming. So the question is, are there more defections? Is there a morale problem in the Russian movement? Do they have ammunition and logistics resupply problems? This is why there's an urgency to what we're providing to the Ukrainians as well as the psychology side. It relates to the question about moving to the West they didn't anticipate having tanks in Uzhgorod on the border with Poland and Slovakia. They anticipated having a vassal Ukrainian state that would collapse and they could control. That's not happening. So this is going to get much messier and more complicated on their end. It's why I think they could play a card of trying to partition Ukraine. We want to offer uh, Hungary its former territories to provoke a crisis in the alliance. Um, and I just would close by saying Maya is so right. We owe it to the Ukrainians and their bravery um, to find the silver lining, to do things that are extraordinary right now around kleptocracy, around support for democracy, um, uh, around uh, supporting countries like Moldova and Georgia. Um, and ultimately, ultimately you owe the Ukrainians what I hope will be a generational commitment, a generational movement to defend democracy and to resist tyranny. Frank. If you have any thoughts on uh, from, any a other questions. from a positive standpoint, you can see that um, all of Putin's arguments for going in are surrounded by it's a false narrative, but he's still trying to use international law as a justification for doing what he's doing. So that's a that's a win for international law and the inter international order that we have. Um, but that's that's from an international perspective see that he still believes in the international law and that's why he's making these false narratives to, to justify it. And I absolutely agree with this veneer of legality. I have been referring to this veneer of legality that has been dri driving the Kremlins uh, for, for um, more than a decade. In 2014, uh, the referendum in Crimea was not about, in the, was not about uh, joining Russia, uh, but Russia could accept in its territory only independent states. So the referendum in Crimea was not about independence. It was, I'm sorry, it was not about independence. It was about uh, re, 
uh, so closer ties with Russia. And, Russia, and, and then Russia was seeking this uh, legal justification to incorporate Crimea in its constitution, in its territory, uh, by going to the uh, parliament of Crimea. And so Russia has been looking for this uh, veneer of legality uh, to justify the invasion under the false flag operation uh, in Crimea in, uh, in the weeks anticipating, uh, or the weeks before uh, February 22nd, 24th, uh, creating this idea that uh, the Ukrainian government actually is committing genocide rather than the other way around. Um, so I agree with, with this idea of veneer of legality that has been there. And I'm out of time, but I want to comment very quickly about uh, Max. Uh, the Western response. Uh, with, Max, you can go ahead and take a few more minutes and a couple more questions. We have a couple people down here with mics and there's other people. So why don't we let this session go for five more minutes or so, okay? Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so a uh, comment about Maya's question on, on uh, looking for silver lining and uniting in the United West. And, and I have two, two, country, two examples of countries, Poland and Hungary. Those have been pariahs of the Western, of the European Union of, over the last decade because they have been violating uh, the European Union, European, Un, European Union laws and, and, uh, and, and they were undermining human rights and they were undermining independent judiciary. Well, you know what Viktor Orban said when sanctions were imposed on Russia. He said, it's not time to be smart now. It's time to impose sanctions. And so there is solidarity in, within the European Union. The, the UK, uh, the British exited the EU in uh, 2016 legally last year. Uh, they have been very, very, uh, they, they were playing a very uh, important role, a concerted role with uh, other European Union countries and with, with the West. As far as uh, Lviv bombing, uh, I think that uh, the, the sites that have been bombed so far has, have been military sites, uh, sites that have been either uh, air, air, air sites or airports uh, or uh, military barracks or military uh, storage facilities. And so my, my hope is that it's not going to go further, but I agree with Damon that uh, the expectation was not to see tanks in Western Ukraine or Western uh, Ukraine in the north uh, parts of the country. Uh, and uh, you, you, Russia was really expecting, uh, and, and maybe this was a promise given to Russian soldiers, that U Ukrainians were, will greet you with uh, open arms. And that has not been happening. Uh, and, and I think it has been puzzling to many Russian soldiers. Some of them are, have been born in the year 2001, 2002. So they are in their 20s, 19, 20 year olds and draftees. It was surprising to them that Ukrainians were resisting. And so there is some disconnect there. Um, nice job, guys. A lot of people are, um, they are looking, they want to know what NATO and what Biden, President Biden can do to take it up a notch on the military side short of a no-fly zone. What, do you guys have any ideas in terms of what, you know, what a small kind of incremental steps that, that NATO could do um, in order to take this up without, without a no-fly zone? And do you agree that, that blocking the MiG-29 uh, jet transfer was the right decision? Thanks. Related to that, I'd like to ask the panel what they would like to uh, see come out of this meeting of Western leaders this week. With regard to uh, Russia itself, the Russian people, would they support a coup in the Kremlin? Jonathan? Um, when I was at the MacArthur Foundation, we supported um, an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty chaired by Gareth Evans of Australia that came up with the concept of the responsibility to protect that uh, argued that when a nation couldn't uh, or wouldn't uh, defend its people, uh, that it was the international community's responsibility. And if the UN didn't act, 
than it would, uh, or uh, NATO wouldn't act or whatever, uh, then it would be a coalition of nations of the willing. Um, and I'm wondering uh, where that concept uh, uh, stands. We haven't heard anything about that, and uh, it would argue not so much that NATO has the obligation, but that uh, a coalition of the willing that could go beyond NATO, so it wouldn't be uh, a Russia-NATO con confrontation, it would be a larger, and it wouldn't have to go through the UN. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, do you want to comment on any of the questions? Damon probably has, um, okay. Damon Damon probably has more experience with this, but from the 2008 invasion of Georgia, I thought the President Bush had a, a good policy with opening up a humanitarian corridor, landing planes, and saying, you're not going to go this far. But have we gone past that, that ability to do that? You know, it, it's, uh, first of all, huge, huge kudos to the administration for keeping the alliance together, rallying allies, the actions we've taken on the economic sanctions so far. It has really stunned Putin because his premise of an attack on Ukraine was that the West would not be strong, it would be divided, and the administration has helped nurture that to ensure that that's not happened. So it's a good starting point. Coming out of this summit, I think there needs to be political and psychological clarity that we have an ironclad commitment to helping the Ukrainians win and to be willing to do what it's required to defeat Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it's both a moral, a, a psychological, and a material commitment. There is more practically to be done. Air defense is a huge issue. I think the MiG-29 issue was really poorly handled in the public domain. It's sort of less relevant to the actual needs. It's why the Russians have been trying to take out all the airports across Ukraine so that you actually can't land and operate aircraft as such. Um, but getting S-300s, which are an air defense system that the Greeks and the Slovaks and the Poles have, quick decisions from the Americans to say, yes, NATO allies, give your Soviet legacy equipment to the Ukrainians and we will replace it with ours. So we'll give the Greeks a Patriot system. Greece, you give the Ukrainians the S-300. The Ukrainian forces know how to use that. There are more things that can be done. Speed is essential here. There's more that can be done on the cyber communications, command and control side of the equation as, as well. Um, I think the John's point on, I, I know a lot of folks that do believe we should try responsibility to protect. It's been neutered because this is a nuclear power and there's a right, there's a reasonable concern how not to get into an escalatory conflict with Russia. Vladimir Putin has used nuclear weapons to not have a sense of mutual deterrence, but to use them as blackmail. We've lost the deterrent angle. He uses nuclear weapons as blackmail and has adopted a strategy of escalate to de-escalate. So he wants you to know he will escalate so that it will, he, he thinks he can psychologically intimidate others to back down. He's a bully. And bullies usually need a strong, strong response. So I, I think it's worth, and there are ideas about there of how to think about humanitarian corridors based on a right to protect that could say, look, we're not intervening in the war where Russian forces are not operating, we are going to protect the humanitarian corridors that lead to Vinitsa, that lead to Lviv, and we'll do what we need to protect that. And it's almost it's risky. It's daring him. But I think the thing that he really is concerned about is us. I think we underestimate how much of Vladimir Putin and the Russians, everything they do in foreign policy usually is a calculation about the United States. Not the same for us. We don't think that way. We don't operate that. That's how they operate. Um, and so I think it's worth exploring some of those uh, options. We signed a Budapest memorandum in which new, new, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons second, to be guaranteed its sovereignty and territorial integrity by the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia. And we've sort of papered over these obligations because it's really awkward. Russia's a nuclear power, and yet there is a basis for think, figuring out how to do more. Uh, the Russian issue, um, look, we've seen already uh, Vladimir Putin has arrested two top uh, people within the FSB intelligence unit. We've seen uh, some drama in the inner circle. We're hearing a lot about uh, the pressure in the oligarchic circle. Putin is strong, but there is, an there is a 
cadre, a coterie of folks that really help run this, this country, um, there's going to be extraordinary pressure on them. We have no idea. We've seen them arrest 15,000 average Russians who have protested the war. We don't know. We can't predict. This has to be the Russians, and they're taking this into their own hands. But I think we do know that Ukraine is not safe. And frankly, the concept of freedom and democracy will be challenged as long as he's in the, in the Kremlin. But it will have to be an issue for the Russian people. I, I just want to make a couple of, if I may, a couple of uh, comments about uh, the coup in, in the Kremlin, because I think that if we look at uh, the history of the USSR and independent Russia, Russian leaders do not go um, in a democratic way, do not retire in a democratic way. Starting in, this, in the Soviet Union, the leaders have been either dying, in the case of uh, Nikita Khrushchev, he was removed in a, in a coup, in a quiet coup, uh, he was removed to his dacha. Uh, Gorbachev survived a coup, but then he ultimately lost his job. Uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, Boris Yeltsin, uh, he, he did not uh, die in office, but he died very shortly after he gave the reins out to Vladimir Putin. So what is the, and, and Dmitry Medvedev has been kind of an aberration out of this pattern. So what is the expectation of how power is going to be transferred? Um, the leader is going to die or the leader is going to be uh, removed in a, in a coup? Who is, if it's, a, if it's a coup, who is going to be a, a potential challenger? So there are three types of oligarchs. There are some people who are very close to Vladimir Putin who are personally loyal to him. There are economic oligarchs. Those are people are very, very rich too. There are economic oligarchs who accum accumulated their, um, their, their fortunes in the 1990s. And there are also security elites. Uh, so I wouldn't expect any challenge to the power in Kremlin from the economic oligarchs, if anything, or, or from the inner circle of, of Vladimir Putin. I would expect uh, a, a challenge from the security elites. And usually the, the scholars of democratization look at the splits within the elites into hardliners and softliners. So it's an, a very important uh, to, for us to watch right now. So who are these people who are uh, removed uh, from power, who are distance, uh, distant from power, uh, who are arrested, or maybe they, those are the people who are going to break, uh, who create a critical mass of people who will, uh, who will be seeking some kind of change. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm glad I came by today. Uh, some of you know I was appointed the first uh, Sarge acting ambassador to Ukraine, 1990 to 92, 93. Excellent presentation. I think you hit all the right points. One thing I worry about, and I'll ask a question, it's not a statement, is that there is a certain false narrative that is you see on both the extreme right and the left, that it, there is a moral equivalency between Russia and Ukraine democracies and totalitarian states, and have bought the false narrative that somehow NATO expansion or something like that has caused what Putin is doing. It's not the case. I was on the ground. I monitored the first election, the 92 percent, and I've seen the Ukrainian people change since then, have get a sense of Ukrainian identity. There was, from 1917 to 1919, an independent Ukrainian state for 18 months. It's the most liberal constitution. It's written in four languages, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, and Yiddish. So much for anti-Semitism. Uh, so my question is, based on that, what's our end game? How do we hold Russia responsible after the end game? It's going to be very tough. You've got to destroy this society. Russia has a responsibility. Putin does. So how do we do this? What's our end game? And thanks for an excellent presentation. My view is that I think you have to approach this just like uh, Ronald Reagan approached uh, Afghanistan. You have to get them to the point where you bleed them dry. But that's going to that's gonna require the whole world to be involved. Um, so as you know, as a former ambassador, Covert action, all kinds of activities need to be Im implemented, just like that was done in, in Afghanistan. But you need, you need everyone to do it, and to the point where the Russians have to leave. As you were mentioning earlier, 
the Russian troops leave and decide on their own as well as, as they're facing a reality they weren't expecting. Um, and then hopefully um, Vladimir Putin in the International Criminal Court or some other tribunal that's, that's set up like Nuremberg. Just a couple quick points. Um, there is a cycle in Russian history of d disastrous wars being followed after years with change in leadership from a Crimean War, the Russo-Japanese War, even the Afghan War in some respects. And so it's hard to understand what the implications will be of a costly war. Um, I do think the point, as John mentioned, it's worth underscoring because the pretense of this is NATO enlargement and provoked it. It's just really important to remember, I was part of the administrations, in the Clinton and Bush administrations during NATO enlargement. This was not a great American push. We were actually quite reluctant. It was the incessant demands and aspirations of the countries themselves. Hungarians, Poles, Czechs, saying, please, please let us be part. We are part of your family. Let us be part of your institutions. We actually slow rolled it. We tried to come up with alternatives. We're like, um, and there's a narrative now that we imposed NATO enlargement. This is the Baltic states convinced us we were skeptical. And then Ukraine has asked for this. So it's just really important to remember that this isn't a made in Washington approach. What do people want for their own futures? And it's a simple idea of countries being able to determine their own destiny. The end game is really hard to predict. You could see a Russian, a triumphant Russian, Russia, but at what cost of a level devastated Ukraine in which the origins of Russian history are wiped out if Kyiv and other cities are really leveled, a country which is really ungovernable as long as it has Ukrainian citizens in it. You can see Russian forces defeated and at what cost of the reverberation. It's hard to imagine a negotiated, fully negotiated outcome. There have been no clean-ended negotiations. The war in 2014 in Donbass, the Normandy Agreement in Georgia, there's hardly ever a clean negotiated outcome because the positions are almost reconcilable. What becomes more likely is a settled stalemate of some part. It is hard to see, unless there is a complete collapse, how do Russian forces, how do draw back. Look at southern Ukraine today. This is going to be hard. So the end game for us needs to be to ensure that things are being taken place to ensure accountability with time, documenting war crimes and atrocities and holding the process of accountability, security for and rebuilding for any free Ukraine that comes out of this, and a major commitment on the scale of a Marshall Plan-like approach on both security and economic, a rebuilding of a free Ukraine, whatever that may look like. To support those that are in Putin's shadow, it's the gray zone of countries that fall between NATO and Russia that are endangered. It's Moldova's and Georgia. So let's think about that now. And finally, I think we really have to be clear in our rhetoric that we stand by the Russian people and not let this become a, Russian, a Russia versus the world. It's Vladimir Putin's distortion of, of Russia today. The Russian people will have to determine the future of their country. And we need to get them to understand and hear us how we want to stand by the future for a Russian people. So as much as supporting uh, Russians' access to information, Russians who are in exile, getting information back to their home country, that has to be front and center in a long-term approach that's sustainable. And if I may uh, add, uh, thank you, Damon. If I may add uh, my little uh, comment about the lack of optimism. I'm not optimistic uh, as it is where we are right now. I think that there is a, lot, a belief that uh, things will have to be decided on the battlefield before we actually sit down to the table of negotiations, before Russia and Ukraine will sit down to negotiate the final agreement. And what this final agreement is going to look like, Russia will have to walk away from this conflict, from this invasion, with a perception of victory that it will be able to present for its own citizens. Right now, Russia is, uh, Russia's demands are demilitarization, denazification, and written guarantees uh, for Ukraine not to join NATO. I think Uk the Ukrainian president is hinting that we are ready to make a commitment not to join NATO. I don't think that Ukraine is ready to lay down their arms. 
and I don't think there is a question about Nazification of Ukraine. There are no neo-Nazis or Nazi politicians or candidates in the Ukrainian parliament. There are no uh, serious contenders for the presidential election the, uh, in, 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 the Ukra in Ukrainian politics. So Ukraine is not going to lay down its weapons and, uh, and, and admit uh, to give handouts of these separatist regions in Donbass uh, uh, to, to give them independence. And by the way, keep in mind that Russia has recognized the two breakaway regions as independent in their totality regions that are controlled by the separatist forces and regions that are controlled by the Ukrainian government. So uh, what does that mean for the negotiations? Ukraine would have to give them independence, recognize their independence, and that means losing Donbass, re losing Luhansk uh, uh, and uh, Donetsk region, losing Mariupol, and that could, if, if Russia is controlling Kherson, the city of Kherson in the south right now, that would meet a uh, that would mean a corridor, a land corridor between Crimea and eastern part of uh, Ukraine uh, that would connect Crimea to Russia. Thank you.